Again, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 12, reading to verse 28. This is the word of the Lord. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. And they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, till he hath put all his enemies, all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let's pray once more before we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, this Lord's Day, this Easter morning, uh, for the opportunity to gather together in worship, and for now the privilege of uh, opening your word. Pray that you would bless uh, my preparation and the preaching of your word now, uh, that it might be glorifying to you uh, and edifying, uh, upbuilding to your saints. Um, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, obviously, the, the doctrine of the resurrection is too big comprehensively to cover in a sermon. That's not the goal this morning. The goal is to zoom in on one uh, particular aspect of the res resurrection that's uh, important uh, for us to understand. So that's the, the goal uh, for this morning, uh, specifically looking at uh, what Jesus' resurrection means for us in terms of our resurrection, whether that's something we should uh, be hoping in, whether that's a reasonable hope. Um, I believe what Paul is saying here is that these two things are uh, intimately tied together such that they cannot be separated. That's what we're going to seek to understand better uh, this morning by God's grace. Now, it's become commonplace in our day to find individuals who will identify themselves as spiritual but not religious. Right? That's, a, that's a common phrase you'll hear today. Such a position allows them to avoid, at least for a season, that feeling of rot that comes uh, if you begin to believe that you exist here for no purpose other than to just be a blob on the earth until you die and are no more. Right, that's a pretty hopeless existence, and so people take on this idea of being spiritual but not religious. So they can have uh, a sense of hope in their life, there's something more to live for, even if that remains unnamed and ambiguous, uh, while also having the benefit of not binding to you any law uh, that God would uh, hold you accountable for. And if we're to apply the language and teaching of the Bible to such an approach of spirituality, we could say that this is a great example of forming a god or an idol in your own image. Oftentimes these individuals have a firm belief even in the immortality of the soul. That's not a unique Christian perspective to believe that our souls go on forever and ever. This has been a consistent belief within pagan religions uh, in Christ's time, before then, down through the ages. To be spiritual but not religious is not to deny the immortality of the soul necessarily. Plenty of them recognize and believe in an immortal existence of their souls. But there are two primary things that distinguish the Christian faith, the Christian religion, from every pagan religion in regard to the afterlife. First, the Christian religion teaches plainly and unapologetically that peace, which is what all these religions are striving for, ultimately, some level of peace. The Christian religion teaches that peace for man can only come through the mediator, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And that by faith. There's no way to peace, no way to happiness, no way to joy and gladness after death, but by Jesus Christ. Immortality, which we believe in as well, is a horror for those who have spit in the face of the eternal God while they were in the flesh. Or they're going to be held accountable for the deeds done in the flesh, in the body, 
And so immortality in and of itself is not good news by itself. But if you haven't been reconciled to God in Jesus Christ, then immortality is a horror, not good news. So Christians believe that we all have souls which will never die. Right? If you're working on the catechism with your kids, that's probably something that they're saying back, right? Do you believe you have a soul? Yes, I believe I have a soul that will never die. How do, I, how do you know that you have a soul? The Bible tells me so. But those souls are only going to be at peace if we are trusting in the only one to bring us peace with God. Again, the mediator of the new covenant, Jesus Christ. But the second thing that distinguishes Christianity from every pagan religion, which speaks of the immortality of the soul, is that our hope is not specifically placed in the immortality of the soul. Or even when you read the Bible, not talk, it doesn't really talk about heaven a ton when it talks about our hope. Heaven's going to be a glorious place. It's something to look forward to, something to keep our eyes fixed on. But particularly what is going to happen in heaven. Right? What does the Bible tell us is our, our great hope? Well, it talks about the resurrection of the body. The resurrection of the body is our great hope. Now, even the Old Testament clearly taught the resurrection of both the just and the unjust. If you remember back to when we looked at that text in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus says, Jesus is asked by the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. Remember, he says, uh, he goes to a text we wouldn't necessarily expect. He does that for the Sadducees' sake, going to the Pentateuch, a book that they believed, to say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? To say that he, and he's the God of the dead, not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Right? But another place we go that's much more explicit would be Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, and every one everyone that shall be found written in the book. And verse 2 it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right, so resurrection was a clear idea even in the Old Testament. Uh, it's not a new concept that Jesus was bringing to the table. This is a consistent testimony, of course, of the New Testament as well. We do not hear the apostles talking about the hope of a, a disembodied existence of our souls, which is the way most Christians today think of heaven. We do not even properly hear again of heaven in general very much. We don't know much about heaven. The emphasis of the New Testament when it speaks of our hope as Christians, again, is the resurrection of the body. This, of course, cuts directly against the grain of the Gnostic tendency among Christians today to see the physical, the material world as fundamentally evil. That's a Gnostic idea. A spiritual equals good, physical equals bad. Right? The problem isn't our sin. The problem is just being in this, this body of death. Right? And so the goal is to be delivered from this body of death in the sense that uh, we no longer have a physical existence. We're freed from the physical. But that, that, of course, cuts, that goes directly contrary to what God says when he made all things. Very physical things that he made and then declares them good. Right? Declares them good. So the physical is good. Sin is bad. Physical is good. This concept of the resurrection of the body opposes those spiritualists who think of putting off the body as liberation. And so our, our hope in the resurrection of the body is a testament, consistent testimony to uh, the goodness of matter, the goodness of things, physical matter. At the same time, the biblical doctrine of the resurrection of the dead does not leave the materialist comfortable either. We do not deny the existence of the soul or of a heaven which now exists, but instead we understand that our hope involves the redemption of the physical along with the spiritual, of heaven coming to earth. That's the way the Bible talks about heaven, heaven coming to earth. We believe that God will raise his people at the second coming of Christ, causing the new Jerusalem to descend out of heaven from God, as God makes his dwelling with man and then gives us the inheritance he's promised us. What are the meek going to inherit? The meek are going to inherit the earth. Right? God's going to make his dwelling with us. There's going to be a redeemed earth for us to inhabit with our Lord to praise him forever. The testimony of the Christian is that of Job, which Lance read for us this morning from Job chapter 19. It says at verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, right, long after I'm in the grave, yet in my flesh, bodily resurrection, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold. Right, His eyes, not foreign eyes, not eyes that he had never had before. His eyes, his very eyes, redeemed, shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. 
So this hope of the resurrection is at the very heart of the Christian faith. And certainly the heart of what we celebrate each Easter. And the resurrection of the dead has required uh, many defenses throughout church history. We're in another season of that now. uh, In which it must be defended even by uh, those amongst Christian ranks. That Jesus in history rose from the dead. And that that has implications for us. Inescapable implications. And these defenses are not something new, as I just mentioned, uh, but stretch back all the way to Paul's time in Corinth, all the way back to the apostles. One such defense was made gloriously by the apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, I encourage you, uh, either today or tomorrow, read through all of 1 Corinthians 15. It's, there's much more to be talked about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in regards to the resurrection, understanding uh, this doctrine. Uh, Paul goes, at, goes, to it, goes through it at length in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, you may think of Corinth as a church uh, laden with, when you think of 1 Corinthians or just Corinth as a church, you probably think of uh, lots of moral deficiencies. You think of Corinth, you think, man, there's a lot lot of of sin going on there in terms of the way they were conducting themselves, a lot of of lifestyle problems, if you can put it that way. You've got sin in doctrine, and then you've got sin in in lifestyle, living a life of holiness. You think of Corinth, and you think, man, they were were messed up. But you may not think of them as... uh, you know, the second half of the letter, Paul's going through uh, doctrine after doctrine. And I think what we should see there is that those two things are uh, intimately linked together, right? Unholy living leads to bad doctrine. Bad doctrine leads to unholy living. That river can flow either way. Uh, but that's why Paul tells Timothy to guard your life and your doctrine, right? Both of these things are vital. We can, you can think, oh, I can have all my theology buttoned up and live the way I want to live. It's just not going to play out that way. That's just not how we treat our sin. We love to make little carve-outs in our theology for this particular sin that we happen to be uh, a fan of, unless we like to indulge. And so guard life and guard doctrine is what Paul tells Timothy. Corinth is a good example of a church that had failed. Whatever one came first, I don't know. (laughs) But they had failed in one, and so we see uh, immorality in their life and uh, a failure in doctrine, right? A a gospel, and that's what Paul starts. We'll look at it here shortly, but that's how Paul starts the the chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is he starts by laying out the gospel. And one of the things that uh, these Corinthians are denying is essential to the gospel, right? And so this is not, these are not tertiary issues of, oh, you know, you've got these little problems now in your theology. No, they're they're starting to preach a gospel if they're preaching this way, teaching these doctrines. They're starting to preach a gospel that doesn't save, right? So whether it was the immoral living that started, whatever it was, uh, these things are completely out of sync in Corinth. And so again, Paul lays out in these uh, first eight verses, I'll just read through them, uh, the first eight verses of 1 Corinthians, he lays out just a very, uh, it's glorious, but it's a very bare bones, here's the gospel, right? If you have eight verses to give someone the gospel, here's just the the historical facts of what Jesus accomplished, who he was and what he accomplished. Uh, And it's a great place to go in evangelism. Uh, I think, I believe it was Paul Washer, I was talking with Eric recently, uh, but with Jehovah's Witnesses, he'll ask them a couple times, he'll say, hey, tell me what the gospel is, right? And they'll, they'll talk about the kingdom and, and all these things, and, so, and he'll have him repeat it one more time so he's, he feels like he's really understanding them, and then repeat it back to them. Okay, you think, if you have time to give me just the good news of the gospel, what is it? They'll talk about the kingdom, right? Dwelling on the new earth, these types of things, but not talking about death, resurrection of Jesus as our substitute. And then what he says he'll do is he'll jump to 1 Corinthians 15 and say, here's the gospel. This is the gospel. And then you can tie that into Galatians 4, right? If somebody comes to you, the same same apostle Paul, if somebody comes to you with any other gospel than what I've preached to you, let him be accursed. There's one gospel that saves, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what Paul gives us here. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. So they're not in a place where they're denying the gospel, but the doctrines that they're starting to entertain are bringing in that, that way. It says, By which ye also, are also, ye also are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen, right, proof of this resurrection, seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, right? Most of them are still alive when Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and, of, and last of all, he was seen of me also, right, part of 
cr- criteria to be an apostle, seeing the risen Lord. Paul as well saw the risen Lord as one born out of due time. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. So this is the gospel Paul is defending in his argument. So as you reread the rest of 1 Corinthians, as you read 1 Corinthians 15 later on, uh, the entirety of the chapter, this is the gospel that Paul is defending. The gospel that he's laid out in the first few, few verses of this chapter. And at the center of this gospel proclamation by Paul, which he received of Christ, he tells us, is the fact, right, historical fact, first and foremost, that Jesus rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel Paul's declaring, the gospel he's going to be defending. Paul will continue in this chapter by making a logical argument regarding the implications of this truth of Christ's resurrection for our resurrection from the dead at the end of history. That's what's being talked about here. Paul's argument for the general resurrection of the dead centers on the objectivity of Christ's bodily resurrection. So now looking at verses 12 and 13 of our text this morning, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Remember again, the timing of this is very important. Uh, Paul's ministering shortly after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He's able to cite the fact that Jesus was seen by above 500 brethren at once. 500 men saw him at once, and most of them are still alive. He's reminding the Corinthians of this reality. In light of all this, we should understand this belief uh, that was circulating in Corinth not as a belief that Jesus did not experience resurrection, but rather a denial of a general resurrection of all men. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead at that time was not this disputable fact within the churches. The dispute was not over whether Christ had risen from the dead. That is treated as a settled fact in Paul's line of argumentation. He's using that as a settled fact from which to make a logical argument. The dispute was rather over our resurrection, the resurrection specifically of believers. Paul is plainly preaching the message of Christ's resurrection as he reminds the Corinthians in verse 12. And yet these Corinthians are somehow holding together two teachings that Paul tells them cannot be held together. They're trying to affirm Christ's resurrection while denying the resurrection of his people. And Paul tells them that this is literally an impossibility. He explains this first in verse 13 and makes, he's going to make the same point from the opposite direction in verse 16. Here he says that if we do not rise from the dead, then Christ is not risen. So how, how does that, how do we make that logical connection? How does that logically follow? First, we must keep in mind the purpose for which Christ came, right? The purpose for which Christ came. Why did the father send the son? Who is the gospel for? The father sent the son to redeem a people for himself, to provide a substitute for his chosen but sinful people. So the gospel is for the salvation of the people of God. The gospel is for us. In other words, Paul is making the point that Jesus was not resurrected for his own sake. Jesus was not resurrected for his own sake. He was resurrected for us. Jesus came to redeem a people for himself, and so his resurrection serves as the foundation for our resurrection. Jesus desired and makes this clear in his Gospels, right? What, his, what he came to do, right? To give his life as a ransom for many. To come not to be served, but to serve. To give his life as a ransom for many. To purchase a people for himself. So that was his goal. The argument therefore could be flipped to say that if Christ is not risen, then there is no resurrection. Speaking positively, Paul is arguing that because Christ is indeed risen, There must therefore be a resurrection from the dead for those who are dead in Christ. Christ's resurrection will necessarily bear fruit. It will necessarily bear fruit, and that fruit will be the resurrection of his very body, the church. That will be the fruit of his resurrection. He accomplished what he set out to do, and so his resurrection is a testimony to that fact. He continues the argument at verse 14 and following. He says, and if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if Christ rise not, then is not Christ, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. So again, following this logic that he lays out in verses 12 and 13, Paul says that if it is indeed the case that Christ is not risen, then it would be fair to say that everything he is doing, everything Paul is doing, everything he's preaching is worthless. 
Not only would Paul's preaching be worthless, but faith in Christ himself would be worthless. This is Paul's point here. Faith in Jesus is worthless if Christ is not raised from the dead. If Jesus is in a tomb, faith in him is worthless. And as an aside, this, is a, a great, this argument by Paul is a great reminder of the value of belief in a Jesus in name only. Right To say, I believe in Jesus. Well, do you believe in the Jesus who died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and three days later rose from the dead according to the scriptures? Because if you just have the name Jesus, it's, just, it's not accomplishing anything for you. Right? If it's Jesus who's the spirit brother of Lucifer, he's not going to save you. You're dead in your sins. Your faith is vain. Right? If he's the, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God, then you are yet in your sins. That Jesus does not save. The name of Jesus is worthless, worthless if everything behind that name, everything you mean by that name, is unbiblical. Paul, at this point in his ministry, says he would be falsely representing the teaching of God in the name of God, and, have done, and he would have done so on countless occasions. Right? This is the gospel he preached, and this is the gospel he preached everywhere. And all of that would be in vain. He'd be falsely representing God if Jesus was not risen from the dead. And so Paul continues to drive the same point home in verse 16. There is just no way to believe in the resurrection of Christ and not see the fruit of that resurrection extending to those for whom he came to die. That's the connection Paul is making here. There's an inseparable connection between the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of his people. The only way to properly assert that there's no resurrection for us as the people of God, this is Paul's point, the only way to assert that is to say that Jesus is dead. Jesus is still in a tomb. The second you say, this is Paul's argument, the second you say that Christ is raised from the dead, you have established the grounds by which his people are guaranteed to be raised from the dead. The second you have said that Christ's people are not resurrected, you have denied Christ's resurrection. This is Paul's logic in our text, and remember that it is an infallible logic. This is the word of God. And why is it that Paul says that apart from Christ, the resurrection of Christ, our faith is in vain? Paul says that if, if Christ is not raised, our faith is vain because we are yet in our sin. It's here that we're reminded by Paul of the reason why the resurrection is so vitally important to the gospel we preach. And therefore why Easter is a celebration of the most glorious news for us, but also the most monumental shift in the history of the earth. The history in the a shift in human history like none other. If Jesus is dead, then you do not have any grounds, any grounds to stand before God as one justified, as one legally declared righteous. No grounds to stand there. Now it's true to say that Jesus' death paid for our sins. It's a true statement. But this is the case because Jesus now lives. That's how we know that his death was sufficient. We cannot have life in a dead man. That's not how the Bible talks about us having life. We don't have life in the death of Christ. But only through the one who died for us and rose from the grave. Both are essential. Paul uses this exact line of thought in Romans chapter 6, picking up at verse 6 of Romans 6. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Right? That's our motivation for killing sin. Not that we in and of ourselves can just overcome all of our failures, but the fact that that man, that old man, has been killed. He's been crucified with Christ. For he that is dead, he says, is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, what? Being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, like what do we do in light of that? Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have resurrection life because Christ is raised from the dead. We're united to him by faith, and therefore we can put to death our old man. It's been crucified with Christ. We can live, put on the new man, walk in newness of life because Jesus walked out of the tomb. He is risen from the dead. Death has no more dominion over him. In other words, life does not come to us through the death of Jesus. The payment of our sins was made in Christ's death, but the life we live is a life we participate in through union with the risen Lord Jesus. Hebrews likewise sees the defeat of death 
in Christ's death while also seeing Christ's death as not being the end of his ministry. But it was a means to an end. And so if you're denying the resurrection of Jesus, you're denying that end for which he came and, and denying the end uh, that he ministers to us now. So this is Hebrews chapter 2 at verse 14. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, speaking of Jesus, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and destroy them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Right. So he died for our sins. He freed us from the bondage that the devil held us in. But verse 17 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus defeated death and the devil by taking death upon himself in the place of his people. It's also abundantly clear that death would, not, would only be seen as defeated in Christ conquering death and living forevermore. Right? The end for which he came was to be a high priest for us. He's got to raise from the dead for that. Right? What good is a dead high priest? He died so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. He died so that he might rise and so that he might be the perfect mediator of the new covenant for his people and have the nations as his inheritance. And so no resurrection for Jesus. Not only does not that mean no resurrection of the body for us, it's, there's a, a more fundamental problem we have to deal with first. There's no forgiveness for sins. There's no forgiveness for sinners. No resurrection for Christ means no life for those dead in trespasses and sins. No resurrection of Jesus means no peace with God for transgressors like us. Only damnation. But of course, this means also, we must understand this, that the flip side of this is true as well. The flip side of this is true as well. If Christ is raised from the dead, then what? Right, here's the truth. If Christ is not raised from the dead, your faith is vain. Hope in Christ, no such thing. But what if he is raised? Well, if Christ is raised from the dead, then forgiveness of sins is preached unto us in the gospel. If Christ is raised from the dead, then we who believe in Christ are not in our sins. That's a glorious truth. This means that the penalty for our sin has been paid for in full in the death of Christ. And it means that we can have the life that Paul talks about in Romans 6. We can have that now. You don't have to live in your sins here and now. You can have freedom from them. Or you can have life in the new man, not living in the ways of the old man, because that man is crucified with Christ, and Christ rose from the dead. You can have new life in him. We can do this not only because the penalty for our sins is paid for, but because the power of sin has been broken in our lives. That's what Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews 2. Where there's no bondage now that the devil has over us. We're no longer in our sins unto condemnation. We are also no longer under the power of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin, but what does Paul say? We're slaves to righteousness. Not only this, but the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead means that this earth has not been forsaken by God. This earth has not been forsaken by God. God has cursed the entire earth because of the sins of men. Or the sin of men. But the resurrection of Christ began an entirely new order. And this is what I was referring to earlier when I said that the resurrection began a cosmic shift in all of history. Christ's covenant, the new covenant, which he established, would not end like the old covenant. Right? The old covenant ended with a decimated temple. Right? Go to that spot, and you, Josephus says you, you go to the spot where the temple was, and you can't even tell where the foundation was. You can't even see it anymore. That's how the old covenant ended. But Christ would end with the glorious temple in Ezekiel's prophecy. Right? There'll be waters flowing and bringing life to everything it touches. The nations will be flowing to the mountain of the Lord. Right, as we sing in Isaiah 2. The knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's where Christ's kingdom is headed. And we can not only think of people or souls when we think about the glorious fruit of Christ's resurrection. When Jesus says that he's making all things new, he is speaking of the whole creation. We read this in our uh, New Testament reading this morning. Paul speaks in Romans of the groaning of all creation and it's awaiting of the consummation of this kingdom. Now, this is picking up at verse 18 of Romans 8. 
It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hear that again. The earnest, the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was not made was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. So the creation has hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Notice here that it's not simply a spiritual resurrection which Paul speaks of. What's our great hope? What should we be looking forward to when we think of life after death and specifically the second coming of Christ? What's the consummation, Paul says, of our adoption as sons of God, which will be manifested in our bodily redemption, the redemption of our body. Our physical bodies will be glorified, sin done away with, and the earth restored to be a fit habitation for God and man in the new Jerusalem. All of creation awaits this glorious day, and that's because all of creation knows that its redemption, its deliverance from bondage, is intimately tied to the redemption of the children of God. That's what they're awaiting. Romans 8 ties in well with what Paul says in verse 19 as well, but first let's read uh, verse 18. That's where the logic of this begins. So verses 18 and 19 of our text says, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So after arguing that those alive have no forgiveness for sins if Christ is not risen, and that's what we just saw, Paul applies the same problem of not having a resurrected Christ to those Christians who have died trusting in Christ before he came, awaiting a glorious resurrection. If Christ is in the grave, then those who died in Christ are dead forever. Taking these two verses together, it seems to be the case that there are those in Corinth whose understanding of life after death had been so corrupted at this point that they did not even believe necessarily in the continuing life of the soul. In this it appears that they had become like the Sadducees of Jesus' day, not even believing in this immortality of the soul. This would seem to be the logic of what Paul is having to argue against because they are asserting not only that the dead were not, who were trusting in Christ have perished, but that hope in Christ is worth nothing after our mortal lives. Right? There's no carryover beyond this life for trusting in Jesus. Now some have said that verse 18 is only teaching that there's no bodily resurrection, only a continual existence of the soul after death, but I don't think that fits well with verse 19, which seems to imply that our hope in Christ ceases with death itself. That seems to be the thing that Paul's having to attack here. Verse 18 seems to imply that the teaching going around Corinth was asserting the ceasing of existence at the point of death rather than understanding the proper biblical teaching of the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of both the just and the unjust on the day of judgment. And part of Paul's point is that this indeed would be the case if there is no resurrection. This indeed would be the case if there is no resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then everyone who has died is simply dead and gone. That's it. If there's no resurrection, then Christians should be pitied because they're banking everything on a hope that doesn't exist and will profit them nothing. Christians are just going through life making it harder on themselves with no payoff. They're putting off carnal pleasures for the sake of an afterlife that doesn't exist. Pitiable. Right? If this life is it, find something better to do with your time. If this life is it, then stop sacrificing so much as each of you do to live for Christ. If there's no resurrection, then you're living for a dead man. That's what you're doing. What a foolish thing to do, to live for a dead man. Stop pouring yourself out for the good of others in this congregation. Stop dying to yourself every day in an effort to be a better husband, a better father, a better wife, a better son or daughter. All of that's useless useless if there's no resurrection. That's what Paul has said. Everything is in vain. Not just your faith. Everything. Everything is vain. Again, this is why we see the resurrection of Jesus at the heart of the Christian faith. Looking back at Romans 8 momentarily, Paul says not only that uh, it is worth living life in obedience to God's commands, following after Christ, he goes even further and says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What is that glory which Paul was confidently awaiting? 
It was, as he goes on to say, as we saw in Romans 8, the redemption of our bodies. Not worthy to be compared. Having sought to show the importance of the resurrection of believers through this series of logical arguments, Paul continues at verse 20 by now asserting the truth of the matter. He has laid it out. This is folly. Okay, to say there's no general resurrection is folly if you believe Christ is raised. They're intimately connected. Either Jesus is risen and his people risen in him, they have that hope set for the future. It's guaranteed because Jesus is risen from the dead or neither is true. But you know Jesus is risen from the dead. He's appeared to over 500. Most of them are still alive today. You know it's true. And if that's true, then what he came to accomplish will come to pass. His people will be raised from the dead. And so he says at verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Right, done with this logical argument, done with this, this folly. He says, Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Right, Paul is not actually contemplating in 1 Corinthians 15 whether or not Jesus is resurrected throughout his argument. It's a settled matter, again, from which Paul has been making this argument that our resurrection is inseparable from Christ's. Again, Jesus came to redeem his bride. This was the purpose of his work. His resurrection was not for his own sake, but for ours. And so Christ is risen, he says, as the first fruits. Now, as for those who sleep, there can be controversy here as well. Uh, some people teaching what, what's called soul sleep. That's not what Paul's talking about here. The idea that both soul and body are uh, you know, unconscious in the time between death and the, res- the second coming of Christ when he'll raise us. We believe that, uh, you know, Paul says it's better to die and to be with Christ. But he tells the, the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there's obviously a conscious existence uh, that they're going to have that's separated from a bodily existence, right? Separation of soul and body. And so we believe that at the second coming, those things will be brought back together. Christ will raise our bodies. They'll be reunited with a soul, but we don't believe in this idea of soul sleep, an idea that uh, there's an unconscious existence uh, between uh, death and the second coming of Christ, right? To die now is better to be with Christ. It is to be with Christ and therefore better. But this has become what most Christians think of eternity in heaven, right? Most Christians think of a disembodied existence at the end, as the end for which they were made, not understanding the goodness of the physical world, the goodness of the bodies which God has given us, and not recognizing the totality of the transformation of all things which will be worked in the world in light of Christ making all things new. Right? We talked about this when we looked at that passage from Mark I mentioned earlier that uh, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Uh, our bodies are not the one thing that, that Satan will win. Our bodies are not the one thing that Satan gets to hold on to and say, at least I got something. No, Jesus is going to make all things new. He's going to overthrow all of that. And so our bodies will be raised to newness of life, to glorified everlasting life. The hope of the Christian is not a disembodied existence in heaven. The hope of the Christian is the resurrection of the body, the receiving of the inheritance of a restored and glorified earth, dwelling on that earth in fellowship with God and with his people forever. Christ is, it says, the first fruits of this hope, which means clearly that there is a much greater harvest of the same kind of resurrection to follow. That's the implication of that. Right, the first fruits come before the general harvest, and the general harvest is far greater in scope. Far greater in scope. Those who sleep in Christ will have a great harvest to look forward to because Jesus was not was only the first fruits of this resurrection, not the only resurrection, the first fruits of this resurrection, many to follow. In explaining the scope of this general resurrection of believers, Paul goes on to explain it in light of Christ's work as the second Adam. He does this in verses 21 and 22. He says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Just as death passed on all men through the sin of our forefather Adam, so in Christ there is an imparting of resurrection life to all men who are in him. Now some may say that the uh, imparting of resurrection life to all men who are in Christ would be to add to the text of Scripture. That's not what the text says. The text simply says that in Adam all die, and in Christ shall all be made alive. How is this not very clearly teaching universalism? The idea that all men and women will be saved, nobody left to suffer under the wrath of God in hell. Right? All in Adam are dead, all in Christ shall live. 
I don't spend too much time on it, but there's at least three reasons, at least three reasons, three ways that we should understand uh, how this text is not teaching universalism. First, read the next verse. Understand the context. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after which they that are Christ's at his coming. So first, in the immediate context, we see Paul qualify those who are to receive resurrection unto life. It's only those who belong to Christ who will be made alive in him. But more broadly, we see Paul speaking elsewhere of Adam and Christ as federal heads. This is not a foreign idea in scripture at all. Adam and Christ serve as representatives of all those who are properly under their covenantal headship. Adam is the federal head of all who come about by natural means. Every man and woman who come about by natural means. All men and women have Adam as their first father, their oldest ancestor. Adam serves as a federal head for every man and woman woman who has ever come about through normal human procreation. Because of this, Adam's sin is justly imputed to every man and woman born of him. All men and women under Adam are therefore born in sin. The wages of sin is death, and so in Adam all die. But Christ, as federal head of the new covenant, is the head, in this sense, only of those who are united to him by faith. He's, of course, Lord over everything, but he is the covenantal head over those who are united to him by faith. Jesus, of course, reigns as Lord over the earth. He's federal head over those whom the Father has given him. These are the individuals who have hope in a resurrection unto life. Paul makes this same argument of federal headship in Romans chapter 5. At verse 14, he says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Headship language, figure of him who was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Right, Applying to more than just himself, as Adam sinned did. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came unto upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made slaves, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Same idea, this federal headship uh, is Paul's understanding in our text as well as in Romans 5. Both Adam and Christ were federal heads. Everyone under Adam receives death. Everyone under Christ receives the free gift of Christ's righteousness unto justification of life. Those are the first two reasons. The third reason we should understand that this text is not teaching universalism is that we have clear passages in the Bible about the day of judgment which awaits the wicked, and that wicked men will be present on that day. There'll be a separation of the sheep from the goats, which assumes that the goats exist. That's a people group. We must not isolate difficult texts in the Bible. We need to understand them in light of the whole of Scripture. Now coming back, to so I read verse 23 to give us that context that it was referring to a, a subset, those who belong to Christ who are going to receive this resurrection. We're taught in that verse also that uh, by Paul, when to expect this general resurrection. When to expect this general re resurrection in verse 23. It will be at Christ's second coming. This is clearly the second coming which is being described by Paul based on what follows in the text. Verses 24 through 26. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy shall be destroyed is death. So Paul is describing here for us the end, of, the end of all things. A time in which all but one enemy will have been destroyed. All but one enemy. Now has this time come about at this, at this time? People are asking that question right now. Are there a few enemies of Christ remaining today? Just a few. Just a couple. Right, I would say so, but all these enemies we read will be put down. Right, there will be no rulers exalting themselves over and against the law of God. No authorities seeking to usurp the power which God has given them. No uh, abortion pills being handed out at a local coffee shop day in and day out. 
This will take place progressively throughout the millennial reign of Christ until he has put every enemy under his feet. We must understand, and, right, and when we talk about Christ putting his enemies under his feet, there's two ways that that can happen. Right? We pray for Christ to be exalted above all, worshipped by every creature which he's made. There's two ways which Christ puts his enemies under his feet. Always involving judgment. Right? Either the judgment is on his son, Jesus Christ. Right? He was judged for us. It's not like our sins weren't judged. That's what it means to be forgiven of God. No, God is a just judge. So he's going he's gonna to punish sin. So judgment either comes on Jesus Christ, who died for sinners, or it's going to come, judgment upon their own heads, judgment to the praise of God's righteousness. But one way or the other, God will vindicate his name. But it's day. That's why we get to go forth, even to a place like Flying M, to this college. We get to preach the gospel of life unto them. As they promote nothing but death and debauchery, we can preach a gospel of life to them, Pray that God would conquer them in that way. If he chooses another way, then praise be to God. As he puts his enemies under his feet. We must understand this as part of the implications of Christ's resurrection and ascension. The implication of Christ's resurrection for us is that we will also be resurrected, but there are many more implications as well. One of those implications is that Christ must now reign. He has risen and ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's been vindicated, or as Peter say in Acts 2, he's been vindicated as both Lord and Christ. And he'll reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last we read being death. There are many enemies today, but when only death remains, Christ will destroy that as well. On that day, Christ will raise us up bodily, reuniting those that slept in Christ with their now glorified bodies, presenting us to the Father as that glorious bride, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. There's not a resurrection that is, this is not a resurrection, rather, that has already occurred for us. Now, we've certainly been raised spiritually. We've been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, but this was only the first fruits of the bodily resurrection which we await. And so Christ died and rose that we might die and rise in him. And because this is the case, we are of all people, of all people on the earth, least to be pitied. Least to be pitied. God has shown us grace. We should be extremely humbled, definitely not pitied. If anything, envied. Earlier, Paul said that everything is vain. Everything is vain if Christ is not risen. Again, we must understand the flip side of this is also true. If Christ is risen, then what? Right? Everything's in vain if Christ is not risen. Well, Paul tells us the then what in his conclusion to this entire chapter of the hope of the resurrection, all the way down at verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, right? in light of this glorious teaching on the resurrection, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If Christ is not risen from the dead, everything's vain. <laughs> if Christ is risen from the dead, nothing you do in the Lord is in vain. Not a single thing. If Christ is risen, there is not a single good work that you will do in faith that is in vain. If you are going about your work in the Lord, all of it is meaningful. All of it is building his kingdom. Right? Every long day at work, every long day with the kids, all of it is meaningful. You can go about your life joyfully laying yourself down joyfully laying yourself down, not only because Christ laid down his life for you, that's vital, right? Christ laid his life down for you, you go and do likewise. Follow your Lord. But also because you know that Christ is risen from the dead. He's going to give you resurrection life, even in the little ways you die to yourself day in and day out. None of that will be in vain. Jesus bids us to come and die so that he might raise us up in resurrection life. This is the promise of the gospel, which we're to bring into all the world. There has been a resurrection right in the middle of human history. Right in the middle of human history, the God-man has died and risen again. This is not only so that you or anyone else can, can invite him into your heart. This is not simply so that you can punch your ticket to heaven. No, this resurrection is far more cosmic in scope. Far more cosmic in scope. Far more impactful for all that we do. Jesus died and rose again to make, he says, all things new. This includes every broken marriage, every strained relationship, every sin that you have struggled against, 
This also includes every enemy currently standing opposed to him, using his good gifts toward wicked ends. All of his enemies will be subdued, either through judgment unto destruction or unto salvation. Jesus died and rose to give you resurrection life here and now by the power of his Holy Spirit, conforming you daily into his image. This means that you have the power to kill the sins with which you struggle. And it means that Jesus will see to it that those sins are defeated. Right? Those sins in your life, are they not among the enemies of Christ, which he will subdue? None of them will last. And so remember that in your fight against them. Which of your sins is coming with you to the new Jerusalem? None of them. The temptation is, by its nature, only able to be a temptation to you momentarily. And so treat it as such. Treat it as fleeting and vain, because that's all it is. A fleeting and vain trap. They will not win the day because they cannot win the day. Christ is the only victor, and you must act like that as you fight against your sin. Like Christ is the only victor. No sin will have the day over him. Your sins will all be put under the feet of Christ. Jesus died and rose so that you can one day, likely long after your body is dead and buried, decomposed, be resurrected to dwell in the consummated new earth with Christ, worshiping him and enjoying all that he has made perfectly new. This is the truth of the gospel we preach, a gospel of resurrection power. It's a truth worth singing of, as we've had the privilege of doing this morning, a truth for which we ultimately ought to be willing to joyfully not only live, but die knowing that we will indeed live again in world without end. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the glorious gospel uh, by which you have saved us, by which you have united us to yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your spirit. We are so humbled to be your people. So grateful, Lord. And we pray that that gratitude would uh, permeate not just today, but just our lives in the way that we seek to live for your glory. Uh, the way that we seek to love one another, those you've placed in our lives, the way we seek to work hard in all the tasks that you've given us, knowing that our work uh, in your name is never in vain, for your Son, Jesus Christ, is risen from the dead, seated at your right hand, uh, putting all his enemies under his feet. We pray that he would continue to do so, uh, that your uh, will would be done on this earth, to the end that the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.